Sup buggers, so I found this Genshin Impact lore iceberg on our Genshin lore and decided, hey, this would be fun. Why not try to do one of those videos that always do pretty well? They're always fun. I'm pretty sure I don't have to explain how these work to any of you, but just in case you live under a rock, this image is an iceberg. It's filled with a bunch of different topics in the case, in this case relating to Genshin Impact lore. And the further down you go, the more obscure they get, hence the idea of an iceberg. In this video, I'm going to go through each and every one and explain all the things on here. I might need to split this up into a second part depending on how long this takes, but I made this video purely so I could have something to put out while I work on my next timeline video. So uh, yeah, that, it doesn't really matter. So without further ado, let's just jump into it. Level one is where the super baseline ideas and stuff that we actually see mentioned to us through the voiced dialogue in game is. The very top is the Fatui, pretty much the military force of the Cryo Archon, whose mission is probably to gather all the Gnosis's, although their mission runs much deeper than that and we don't really know what they intend past that but they're there and they're the most obvious villain in the game. The Archon War is a catch-all term for a cluster of war that happened across Teyvat. They started when Seven Seats opened in Celestia for all the gods in the land to fight over to become the Archons. Slimes being used in, a, in mundane activities probably refers to that time in the very beginning of the game where Amber mentions that using Animo Slimes to take off with your glider isn't allowed. I don't know where uh, what else that might be referring to, maybe to Xiangling using slimes in her dishes, I don't really know. The seven nations of Teyvat are all based on different real world cu cultures, um, and the community is actually pretty sure we have identified which nations match to which cultures. Uh, Mondstadt is Germany slash Western Europe, Liyue is China, obviously, Inazuma is Japan, which is also obvious. Those are the easy ones. Sumeru is the hardest one actually to pin down, uh, because we haven't actually seen anything from the nation, just people and their names. But I always see it compared to the Middle East, uh, the Indian Golden Age, or the most common and the most recent theory is Persia and a lot of Persian influences. But also there are some names that take Sanskrit origins, which yeah, similar is all over, all over the place. Fontaine is probably French and steampunk. Natslan is probably South American, probably around Argentina, as the music that plays during Travail trailer for Natslan is a tango, which originates in Argentina and Uruguay, and Snezhnaya is Russia. Celestia is, in fact, the island in the sky. I don't know if this is ever actually confirmed in game to us through dialogue, but we can gather this from the prologue of the comic where Vanessa ascends to Celestia. Kaya is either from Conria or is the son of a Conria family. I think he tells us this in the game, but it's mentioned in his character story. The Abyss is a thing that we don't really know much about, but it's where these fuckers come from, and it's probably the result of Conria being, sm being smitten into the ground. It could also be another dimension. It's really kind of strange, we don't know much about it, but it exists and it's very well known that it exists. Non-humans in Teyvat I think is supposed to be referring to Hilatrols, who are sentient and intelligent creatures that exist in Teyvat along with humans, and their origin is completely unknown. Or maybe because this is a surface level, it literally could be referring to all the creatures that aren't human. I honestly don't know. Artifact lore being the story of their original user users is actually a theory I haven't heard of before, but it makes a lot of sense when you mention it. Uh, this is the idea that the story that every artifact set has, a shattered story in five parts, tells the story of a certain person. This story is most likely of the people that first used these artifacts, or the people that made these artifacts magical in the first place. Amber's headband is actually a part of her hair. I don't know, man. I Sure. <laughs> okay, level two. Now we're getting into some of the more obscure stuff that most lore enthusiasts will know, but if you're not entirely familiar with the lore or don't obsess over it every single day of the week, uh, you might not actually know much about it. Decarabian was the ruler of Old Mondstadt, which is nowadays known as Storm Terror's Lair. Decarabian was actually a pretty nice dude, creating a safe place from the harsh everlasting blizzard imparted by Andreas way long ago. Um, but the people misunderstood Decar Decarabian's motive and his protection of his people, um, and mistook him for a, as, a, like, as a jerk and a tyrant. So he was overthrown. This is also what Old Mondstadt is referring to on this level. The Irminsul refers to the trees that we see in every domain. Irminsul trees are a direct connection to the ley lines of the world or the magical flow across all of Teyvat. Uh, the trees we see in game are not actually the entirety of the tree, and in fact, all Irminsul trees are connected to one larger tree, which, as the theory goes, is the world tree. But that's getting way too deep. Jiu is a creepy little girl that waits at this tree in Liyue, saying things about her waiting for something under the tree or whatever. For the longest time, we actually didn't know why this girl was here, or what sort of purpose she served, or what she was talking about even, as she did nothing and wasn't ever involved with a quest at any point. Um, she was just kind of foreshadowing for an event in 1.5 where Ajdaha was uh, 
was released and she was actually a part of unveiling Ajdaha as being sealed away in the body of a small girl. Vishabs being dragons is an idea I haven't heard before, but it kind of makes sense. They are dragon-like in shape and form and yeah, a lot of these middle ones are kind of self-explanatory, just things that aren't circulated very often. The entry Gwili could be referring to three things. Gwili plans, which it isn't if it's this far down. The Gwili Assembly, which was an ancient civilization created by and ruled by Guizhong and Morax, or it could be the ship name between Morax and Guizhong. Gwili is a Chinese version of a portmanteau of Guizhong and uh, the name of Morax at the time. So the ship between the two actually naturally becomes that because like 90% of ship names are just portmanteaus. The founding of families on Mondstadt is a really long and in-depth one, so I won't spend too much time on it, but it refers to the stories of how certain families in Mondstadt, most notably the ones that were very prevalent in the aristocracy, came to be. Every family has their own story, and if you're curious, I have a few of the stories covered in my previous timeline videos, so if you want to learn more, then go check those out. Delusions are these things that are meant to mimic the power of visions, but are overall artificial. How they're made is completely unknown, but their only distributor is the Tsuritsa or the Cryo Archon, who hands them out to very specific people. Um, it's I don't think it's just limited to the Fatui Harbingers, but it might be. I don't I'm, I haven't checked that. All we know is that delusions mimic the power of visions, but are also very dangerous to use. This one is an interesting one. Okay, so Virgil Day is the innkeeper of the Wangshu Inn in Liyue. She is towards the top behind the uh, check-in desk and is really interesting because she knows a lot of things she really shouldn't, but she makes no big deal out of it for some reason. She's really mysterious and gives off vibes similar to Zhongli, having some hidden ancient past, but that's only speculation really. All we know is that she knows things that she really shouldn't. There's also um, dialogue of her mentioning that the moon has phases, which that's a whole different story. The Nameless Bard is ironically the name given to this guy right here, uh, seen in Vinti's short story about the fall of old Mondstadt. The Nameless Bard is a major revolutionary force for the fight against the tyrannical rule, in quotations, of Jack Arabian. Uh, this Nameless Bard caught the attention of a Wind Spirit who promptly teamed up with the Nameless Bard. The Bard died in the fight against Jack Arabian, and the Wind Spirit soon became the Animal Archon in Barbados, who took the form of the Nameless Bard in tribute to his sacrifice for the freedom of Mondstadt. Simuru Academia is an educational and academic institute in Simuru. That is sentence is a a lot of words. Um, it's the leading academic institution in Tevat and is probably going to be the center of the Sumer story. Ley lines are a magical flow across Tevat. They are very ambiguous in how they work and where they come from, but all we really know is that they are the magical flow across Tevat, whatever that means. And there are certain hotspots and disruptions in this mag magical flow which we uh, fix and get rewards from. Amos, the bow huntress, is a character that shows up in two places in the lore. In the lore for Amos Bow and in Venti Cinematic, down here hiding in the corner. She was another major player in the overthrowing of Decorabian and also died in the fight, causing Venti to adopt the bow as his weapon in her honor. Alice being a complete sociopath describes the fact that Alice does some pretty wild shit. <laughs> if you read the Tevat travel guides, it describes Alice doing some pretty wild shit to literally anything in her path just because she can, and she has no regard for how her subjects feel. But she's not really evil like the Torre, she's just kind of crazy. Hello trolls have their own conlang. Okay, so for those that don't know, a conlang is the term um, given for fake constructed languages, which is where the term conlang comes from, um, and is a hobby that a lot of people take part in actually. Some very popular conlangs are High Valyrian and Game of Thrones, any language that descri uh, described in Lord of the Rings. Technically, the entirety of Lord of the Rings was created by Tolkien to justify the existence and quirks in his conlangs. That's a whole nother story and technically modern Hebrew. Hillitrails have a language of their own described by Ella Musk and her father's writings, and there are actually some patterns in some of the phrases and how they speak. This has led some people to believe that Hillitrailian is an actually entirely developed conlang. That's a cool idea, and I really hope it's true. Alrighty, layer three. We're getting into some of the really interesting stuff and some of the stuff I had to look up. So if some of my explanations get a little unsatisfa unsatisfactory or in, in some cases entirely wrong, and if they are pointed out, then that's why. We're starting off pretty well because this one I have no clue what I might be referring to. I think it's supposed to be pointing out the fact that Timmy's mother is never actually mentioned. He's an orphan, yes, whose father died in a hunting accident, which is the event that orphaned him, but the existence of Timmy's mother is very weird and unclear and just never mentioned. Okay, the login screen is a very interesting part of the game, and the major theory is that this screen is quite possibly how Celestial looks. This mostly comes from the fact that the architecture of the pillars and the bridges and shit in the login screen 
is very similar to the little bits and pieces of Celestia we know to exist, most notably being the Skyfrost Nail. Mona's Master is a part of what I like to call the Girl Boss Trinity, made up of Alice, Mona's Master, and Ryan Daughter. What's so strange about her is she is the most mysterious of the three characters, and we have very, very few details about her. We don't even know her real name. <laughs> the most we can gleam about her is what we know from Mona's character story, which pretty much sums up uh, uh, to she exists. Tartalia has very strong ties to the Abyss because when he was an aspiring young man, he decided to descend down into the Abyss and learn their fighting styles in order to make himself more powerful, as his entire character dictates. He succeeded, and this trip into the Abyss is what taught him his foul legacy transformation, the second third phase of his boss fight. Jiang Shui is this weird ass guy that appears near Wang Xu Inn. We met him during a daily commission where Smiley Yan Xiao asks us to bring food to him, where we are ambushed by extremely powerful enemies that not even the Traveler can deal with. Like seriously, these things are tanky as fuck. But practically within the blink of an eye, Jiang Shui cuts down the enemies with one strike. Power like this is really uncanny as we always assume that the Traveler is one of the most powerful characters in this world, but here is Zhang Shui who casually becomes Teyvat's equivalent of Saitama for a second and then just reverts to being a regular fisherman. An allogene is another word, technically the official word, for being a vision bearer. Allogene is the word given to these people in the English translation of the game and in other translations like uh, Japanese and Chinese. The term is a Genshin, hence the name of the game Genshin Impact. Okay, this one is actually really interesting and holds a very special place in my heart. The Nameless Island is an island that doesn't even appear on the map that is off the shore of Mondstadt. For a while, the only way to get there was the Kaya Bridge, but now there are other cryo characters along with wave riders that you can get to. This Nameless Island has a hidden quest on it and is really, really interesting lore-wise and is the center of my very, very first Genshin Impact theory. If you haven't done it yet, I highly recommend doing the quest and reading all of the notes and the lore stuff that appears in the quest. It is fascinating and hints at the god of time which is a really really interesting thing that a lot of people talk about the hexen circle which literally translates from german to a circle of witches describes a coven of witches that are dedicated to exploring and understanding the Irmin soul that's really all we know about them and mona's master may have been one of them we're really not sure Havria, I really do not agree with being this far down next to the Hexen Circle and shit like that. You should know who Havria is because there's literally an entire quest dedicated to her. <laughs> Havria is the god of salt who lived in modern day Saltere. Uh, she was a kind god who didn't really want to be affiliated with the Archon War, but her own people eventually murdered her because she was too weak and wasn't able to protect them. Again, this is a topic I covered more in depth in my this timeline video, so uh, go watch that if you want more details, but after this video. The Wandering Troop is a story of a troop of bards who were also really good at fighting. Uh, the story is described in the lore for the Wandering Troop artifact sets and in Ballad of the Squire. Basically, they showed up and with the help of Vanessa, they helped to overthrow the monster at Aristocracy. They're actually really cool and Ballad of the Squire is one of my favorite books in the game, so go, yeah. Okay, this is a weird one. Kole, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Kole is this chick that appears in the manga. She was born sickly and abandoned by her parents in Sumeru um, because of her health and was later picked up by the Fatui. She later separated herself from the Fatui, later showing up in Mondstadt and kind of causing shit to go down. I won't spoil it because it's a story in the manga you should totally go read, but it's really good. Saritza was the Archon of Love is an interesting way of putting this one because there's nothing to say that she isn't still. In the game, we have people tell us that the Cryo Archon is the Archon of Love, which seems strange because of what she's doing to other people, but it has yet to be seen if the Tsaritsa has completely abandoned her role of being the, a loving figure, or if she's just had a change of perspective and is doing what she is doing out of love for her people. The Fall of Conria is another one I think should be at least in the layer above. This is a reference to the old nation of Conria, which was destroyed by the Archons for one reason or another, which we don't entirely know why, but we can make educated guesses as to why the Archons went sicko mode on the nation. It was destroyed 500 years ago, and there are only three people in the game that we know of that have any, any sort of tie back to the nation, Dainsliff, Kaya, and the Traveler sibling. Okay, this is a good one. The Dark Sea is the term given to any part of the world that isn't part of Teyvat, which is to say any part of the world that isn't ruled by the Seven. This name is kind of a misnomer because it also includes land masses. We know there are other continents on the world, or at least there was, and those other continents are also described as being a part of the Dark Sea. Gold on here refers not to the metal, but to the scientist in Kanria that was extremely adept in the art of Kemia, an art able to create life. Gold, who we now know is also Rhine Daughter, Albedo's master and creator, created Durin, the corrupted dragon who causes Dragon Spine to be weird like it is. And this creation is one of the leading theories as to why Kanria is destroyed. She created something that the gods found as disgusting, and so then they went, oh, okay, enough, boom, 
then now Connor is gone. Okay, this video is getting longer than I expected, so I'll wrap it up after this layer and continue in part two. Sumeru was inspired by post-Islamic Persia is a theory that comes from the fact that a lot of names from Sumeru scholars are Persian in origin. That's really all I can find on this one. Visions are also ambitions, echo something that we learned in the Inazuma quest line. The vision gets its power from being the solidified and crystallized form of the vision bearer's ambitions. Having that ambition removed for you by the gods causes all sorts of things to go haywire as we see in the Archon quest. Dane's Lift is another one that should not be this low because we literally meet him in a required quest. <laughs> but uh, Dane's Lift is a character that we meet through some really strange quests in between Liyue and Inazuma's story quest and has some very strong ties with the Traveler sibling. What we know about him is that he was a part of the Royal Guard for the Eclipse Dynasty, the ruling power uh, in Kanria when they fell. The lost sibling accuses him of abandoning Kanria and leaving them to be destroyed, so basically he abandoned his people, but we never got a chance to have his side of the story, so we'll see if that's actually the case or if she's just like, you know, over overreacting. The Triketra is this symbol that we see all across the game. The symbol has a fuck ton of uses across real world religion and culture, and what it represents in game is very, I don't know. But it appears fucking everywhere and pushes the theme of threes in this game. That's all I can give you. Chapter question mark describes the Kanya chapter of the game. It comes from the Travail trailer where after we see all the teasers for the chapters in each of the seven nations, we get to see the title card for chapter question mark, the dream yet to be dreamed, which is to take place in Conria. The question mark being there, I think, is meant to make the chronology of the chapter unclear. Are there extra chapters in between six and Conria, or is just there more to it? Is Conria going to mean we're going back in time and doing it before even the prologue or what? It's, it's there to make the chronology super unclear, but we'll just have to wait years to see. The marriage of Ari is a desert either in the dark sea or in a domain which is supposedly extremely dangerous and deadly going to the marriage of Vari and returning is the mark of an extremely ad adept adventurer apparently bennett is also said to be have found there somehow i don't know petricor is a town in fontaine mentioned by xavier in the tatara tales quest it also describes the smell of fresh rain on dry ground it's one of my favorite scents. Children of Morata described a race or some sort of tribe of people with bright red hair that are very heavily tied to Morata, the Pyro Archon. We know this because of the prologue in the Genshin manga where Venti calls Vanessa a child of Morata due to her blazing red hair. Fairies are a very interesting topic in this game and is the start of the really obscure shit on this iceberg. Fairies in Genshin Impact could refer to a few things depending on what translation you're going off of, such as Seelies and a few folklore characters, as well as specific Loch folk, but the best bet for what a fairy is is the Seelie. The Chinese name for a Seelie directly translates into fairy, so this is probably referring to Seelies, which are a super fascinating thing on their own. Seelies were, according to the legend, a race of beings that were very powerful and special, and used to roam all across the world, both in and beyond modern day Tevat. But after the calamity with the moons happened, they all died out, leaving only these little blue wisps we see in game. And that is all of the entries in the Genshin Impact Iceberg for the first three layers. If y'all would like me to continue this, then let me know. Uh, there are some really interesting discussion points much further down in the iceberg. Um, this is mostly meant to be an easy video to write while I do more extensive research for the Inazuma timeline video, which should be coming out soon, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but if you guys really want to see more, then I will gladly make a second part to this. So yeah, other than that, I'll see you guys in the next one. Later.